have some veterans here today? I bet we do. Would you veterans stand if you can, stand with your families? Go ahead. Right. The music in this place. That particular last song just touched me as I hope it touched you. I'd like you to do something with me today. You know, um, I'm going to get kind of up here so I can see where the drop-off is. Um, my name is not Carl Sutter. I have more hair. Um, in fact, uh, I had a bride, uh, not recently, or just recently, uh, she texted me and she said her computer self-corrected my name to Bible Hoofer. <laughs> so I've had a lot of fun with that name over the years. Uh, please, I'm Richie, and I want you to do something. If you got something in your lap, I want you to just set it down right now. I want you to have your hands available for you. Okay, great. Got them all out there, ready to go? Okay. I want you to extend your hands. I want you to embrace your hands. I want you to extend your hands. You have just spoken in sign language today the mission of Foundations Church. Let's try it again. Put your hands up. Extending. God's grace, exploring, pardon me, exploring God's grace, embracing God's grace. It's a growing process. Sometimes we're here, sometimes we're here, sometimes even we're here. I'd like to share with you today one of the most uh, powerful stories because I have lived it and am living it. It's oftentimes called the parable of the prodigal son. That's almost right. There's two lost sons in this story, and we're going to read about them in just a moment. The parable of the lost sons. But first of all, if you have your Bibles with me, we're going to start with verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the really good religious folk of Foundations Church muttered, this man eats and welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus goes on to tell three quick parables of the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And Jesus continued in verse 11, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods and the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the hired men. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, <coughs> Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, was the reply, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother was so happy and overjoyed, he ran right in and kissed his younger brother. Just wanted to see if you were with me. No, the older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, no longer his brother, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. And then the last conversation of the story. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours, this brother of yours, was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. Oh my gosh. Let's go to that first verse that I read, chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus hanging around with tax collectors and sinners. You know, I find it interesting if Jesus were to come to our fair city, I wonder who would be attracted to him. Would it be the religious folk of Foundations Church and all the other churches, wonderful churches in our community? Or would Jesus be found underneath the bridge down by the river, hanging out with people that were hungry and cold? People who really needed the Savior, but didn't know it, perhaps. For you see, the religious, that is the Pharisees and the teachers of law, they were the ones that found fault. They were the ones who were the religious people but found Jesus to be so offensive. And so I put in your notes, why people like Jesus but not the church? I gotta walk around like Carl a little bit to kinda... Why do people like Jesus but don't like the church? Well, I think it's for a number of reasons. Dan introduced and said that I had pastored churches for a number of years, and I had. Some of the toughest people I ever worked with were my deacon board. Religious people, oh yeah. Knew the Bible, oh yeah. Knew right from wrong, oh yeah. Were tough to get along with and, and cantankerous and had to follow all the rules and regulations, oh yes. Good people. But people, for some reason, that I found myself over the years not liking to go to deacon meetings. In fact, the word deacon kind of scares me, so I'm glad we call them elders here. <laughs> Why people like Jesus and not the church? It's an interesting question. It's an interesting statement. I think oftentimes Jesus looks past the stuff in fact, I know that he looks into our hearts. And he sees, like no other, that the younger brother and the older brother are really very much alike. They're both involved in what I would call their self-salvation program. That is, they're saving themselves by one going out, and your notes have, well, we'll get to a definition of a product in a minute, but... But they both go out and find happiness in different ways. But let's talk a little bit about what is the definition of a prodigal, because I know we've met that slide. The definition of a prodigal, a prodigal does not mean wayward. 
but recklessly spend it. That is to say, both the father and the younger son are prodigals. And you'll note down on the very bottom of the page, The Prodigal God by Timothy Keller, a book that is about this story. The story in the parable of the two lost sons. Talks about this definition of how the father in the story was reckless. He was a spendthrift. If your son or daughter came to you and said, I want my inheritance now. Not when you're dead. Now. What would you do? Well, I can tell you what. In the culture that this story came from, no son would ask his father this question. Because he would be backhanded right out of the room. He would probably be sent to the feeding trough and feed the pigs for at least three months until he learned his lesson that you don't ask for your inheritance because you have just dishonored your father. And the whole community would know this. I find it amazing when Jesus tells this story that the father, and, and he, he adds no other commentary other than to say, he gave him what he asked for. Incredible. In fact, it's way beyond incredible. It's stupefying. It's mystifying. It's unbelievable that the Father would give this wayward son his inheritance. But you can see the storm that's brewing. He goes off into the far country, has a great time. While living is how the Bible describes it. So you can put it in the blank. He has a grand time. He's finding himself. This is what we did in my age. Actually, my hair was much longer. My jeans were quite ripped. And I'm going kind of back that way, but we cleaned a little act up just a bit. <laughs> the way of the lost brother. Self-discovery, free spirit. I identify with that. I've been there. I've done that. I like to think of myself as a free spirit. The lost elder brother, on the other hand, the way of moral conformity. How we do? He stays home. He works hard. He does everything his father tells him to do. In short, his list of sins is quite short. Quite short. Both are trying to find happiness. In fact, there's two ways to find happiness. One is to go out and do your thing, and you'll pay for it later, no doubt. And the other is to stay at home, follow the rules, work hard, and essentially save yourself because you really don't need God because you followed all the rules. This is why in the story, Jesus tells this story, not so much to the tax collectors and sinners, but he really tells it to the religious folk. He's really speaking to me when he says both brothers are lost. But the way of the elder brother is far more <coughs> deep, far more tricky. Because the older brother has done and has followed most of the rules. Now, we all know from Scripture that no one has ever followed all of the rules except for Christ. But the older brother began to develop some attitudes about the direction. I want to first talk to you a little bit about the definition of sin. It's not in your notes, so you've got to look up. How many of you know what the first commandment is? Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt have... No other gods for me. And then comes the list. No idols, no misusing God's name, remembering the Sabbath, honoring father and mother, no murder, no adultery, no stealing, no false testimony against your neighbor, no coveting your neighbor's stuff, house, cars, wife, possessions, anything. This story shows us, and I think Jesus 
drives us deeper in because most of us understand sin as breaking a list of rules. Ten Commandments. The biggies. Jesus drives the point home much deeper when he says it's not just breaking the rules, it's the intention of the heart. It's the intention of the heart. And in fact, both of these boys are on a self-salvation project. They're finding a better way to live without their father. They're finding their self-esteem, their self-worth, all of that by doing it themselves. There's a story that's told about motives. It's a story that's found in the Apocrypha. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a list of stories and collections that the church fathers decided were good, but they weren't quite going to fit into the canon, and so they weren't included. There's a story told about Jesus and about motives. And the story goes something like this. Jesus asked his disciples, I'd like you to do something for me. I'd like you to carry a stone for me. No explanation, no reason why, other than I'd like you to carry a stone for me. So they began to look around. Jesus said, follow me. And so they said, well, he said, pick up a stone for him and carry it. So they, Peter being the very practical one, looked for a nice little small one, kind of shiny, he could rub in his finger. Okay, it comes time for lunch. Jesus gets them all seated, raises his arms, blesses the stones, and they turn to bread, and he said, it's time for lunch. Eat up. <laughs> Peter, <laughs> he didn't get much. We got about as much as we're going to have for communion this morning. It's a little wafer. And that was it. So Jesus, after lunch, says to his disciples, I want you to do something for me. I want you to carry a stone for me. <laughs> Peter gets the deal here. So he goes looking. And he picks up something about the size of this drum set. <laughs> Lifts it. It's heavy on his back and drags it all day long thinking about, oh man, I can't wait for dinner. I'm going to have enough for me, for all of the other folks that gather, for, it was very humanitarian, of course. Uh, I may even have some leftover for breakfast. Great. So, getting towards dinner time, Jesus says to the disciples as they come near the stream, take your stones and throw them in the water. What? Yeah, throw them in the water. Well, <laughs> what's going on here? I, I thought we were going to eat like we did for lunch. To which Jesus says, don't you remember what I asked you to do? Who were you carrying the stone for? Me or yourself? Well, that story is a lot like our faith. We, sorry about that, we oftentimes do things for Jesus because we want to, we understand the project of salvation, we understand, especially younger sons and daughters in here, you understand that you've sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And I would include myself in that story. I was there, I lost it all, I went out, and, and we'll talk about that, but not today. Another day. You can ask me. Lost it all. Some of you identify with the younger brother. Others of you identify with the older brother. Good people, hardworking, went to high school, college, graduate school, and then worked for 35 years. And you folks began to expect that your hard work would get you something. A bigger stone. A <laughs> bigger house. Well, I want you to take and turn in your program to the stories ultimate. We're going to spend some time, and not much time, but a little time on the elder brother lostness 
Because Jesus is speaking directly to religious people. Did he like religious people? He loved them. Did religious people like him? Not particularly. They were always finding ways to trap him. Trying to find ways to, to trip him up. Elder brother lostness begins with anger and bitterness. If you've worked hard your whole life, if you've gone to church when others were out on Memorial Day weekend enjoying the beautiful sunshine, if you've given money to the church, if you gave the pews, or the, well, we don't have pews anymore, do we? we have chairs. If you gave the sound system or money towards the new cross or whatever you gave money to, you have a feeling of ownership. And if things don't go quite the way you want them, you become angry and you can easily become bitter because you paid for some of this stuff. You gave, you were good. You were a good moral person. And so hence number two, elder brother lostness involves their own superiority. We begin to look at others a little bit differently because we have lived our life in such a way and others are obviously not measuring up. I can tell especially the fellow back here in the, in the balcony is not measuring up at all. We begin to look at others and their lives and how they live and certainly their kids and we can easily see that we are better than they. Elder brother lostness. Do we recognize it? Not always. In fact, most of the time we don't. We're the ones that are going to church and we're the ones that are doing the good things and we're the ones that are helping the poor and feeding the needy. Elder brother lostness might also include an unforgiving and judgmental spirit. This gets really close to home, folks. Really close to home because an unforgiving spirit goes hand in hand with the self-justification process of saying, I have done all of these things for you, God. You owe me something. I've sat with lots and lots of patients, Christian people, wonderful Christian people, who have had cancers of all kinds, diseases of all kinds, and they ask the same question. Why? Why me? Well, I don't say this to them immediately, but later upon it, I reflect and I say, why not? Stuff happens. Life is hard. We have a motto in our house. Life is hard. God is grand. God sends us problems. I now look at them as opportunities. Book of Philippians says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when trials and tribulations and problems and heavy stones and burdens come into your life because guess what? It will produce perseverance and faith and long-suffering and all of those good things. But let me tell you this. It's very, very difficult to think that way. It takes a mature thinker. A lot of times you got to have hair my color in order to really get this. And even then I don't really get this. <clears throat> Life is tough. God is great. And sometimes those opportunities that he throws at us, they're called problems, by the way. I'm only I'm kind of sugarcoating this. The serious problems. Have you lost a job? Have you lost a wife, a husband? Have you lost a child? Oh my gosh, we could go on. There's on and on a list of things. Pains of life. And of all things, Paul can write from prison. Consider it pure joy when trials come. Because through those trials, you'll find out what you're made of. And you will turn yourself to the one who can save you. And it's not you sitting in your seat. See, the problem with religious people, and I am one, the problem with religious people is we think that our goodness is going to earn our way into heaven. You know, Smith Barney, some of you, well, you're older ones. You have to 
Thank you, thank you. A little louder, you have to earn, earn it. Yes. You have to earn your salvation. You have to work it out with fear and trembling. And so, there we go. We're joyless. We, we do things because we're, we're fearful of going to hell. <coughs> Number four. Oftentimes we can become joyless Christians. The frozen chosen. <laughs> you know some others. Have you ever been around Christian people that, well, they may never come to a place like this because this is way too extreme. I mean, for God's sakes, they don't even have Bibles in the back of the pew. Oh, I mean the seats. Joyless. Not all, but many joyless Christians. Who likes to be around them? Not me. That's why maybe when I first met Carl on the video back in November when he was at the school talking about the vision, Carl said one thing that I bet you all remember. What did he say? He said, we as a staff will disappoint you. Well, I'm not your staff, so... But I'll disappoint you. I like to think I'm a good Christian, but you know what? Ask my wife, she knows. <laughs> I can say unkind things. Yeah. All right, a couple and then we're done. Five, self-centeredness. Lost elder brothers. They think that they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart for others, but in fact, it's all part of self-centeredness. Amazing. Last one, lack of assurance. They're really fearful people. Really fearful people. That's why they got to keep working. Type A Christians, I call them. Just keep on plugging. Keep on doing good things. Keep on giving. Keep on doing all those good things. The scary part of it here, and I close with this thought, is that sin, oftentimes, what, what's, the, what's the definition of sin? You all know it, don't you? Missing the mark. Sin is missing the mark. Well, Jesus says yes, but, and takes it deeper. He takes us right back to Deuteronomy chapter 20 and says, sin is placing anything else above God. Let me tell you, in case you haven't noticed it, the economy has been tough. How many of you have gone through a job loss? You don't even have to raise your hand. I went through one. Oh, I considered it pure joy. <laughs> I don't know, the depression finally began to lift, but it was tough. I was 55 years old. What's a 55-year-old white-haired guy going to do? I don't know. Pray? Well, yeah, I started that. And you know, interestingly enough, God led Richie back into the ministry in a very strange way. I'm kind of like the doorkeeper. I preach for another church as well, not in their building. Oh no, they don't let me do that. They let me go out and do what I'm really good at, and that is talking to seniors and taking care of seniors. Some of you know I used to work for Columbine Health Systems here in town, managed the Wexford. And it really started to bring me back to the ministry because guess what? As those people got older, 99.9% .9 of them died. <laughs> The other 0.1% will soon. They asked if I would do their service. Can you imagine to be honored such? I said, I would be so thrilled and so honored to do their service. I'm kind of an itinerant preacher, teacher. I'm kind of out there doing stuff. And when Carl said, hey, Richie, would you speak? I need to go on vacation. I said, oh my God, yeah, I used to preach 48 Sundays a year. 48, usually in a row. 
Pressure? Oh yeah. Got to be good? Oh yeah. Jesus points us and says, yeah, sin's missing the mark, but it's also much deeper. It's putting anything, our careers, our spouses, our Porsches, our cars, our homes, whatever, our jobs in the head of God. Two lost brothers. Don't forget the story. You won't. Two very lost brothers. And Jesus ends the story with one brother still lost. Guess which one was lost? The religious one or the free spirit? The religious brother is still in the dark. He needs a true elder brother. And who's telling the story? The true elder brother. His name is Jesus. And he's looking for you and for you. And he's looking for me. Because he loves us. And because it cost him dearly. This isn't just happy and fun games, although I like to make church fun. But it gets serious. All of us are the problem. Religious people, free spirit people, we all are the problem. And God is gathering his church, his people, here today. God bless you. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, what an amazing God you are. You would stop at nothing to gain one of us back. It cost you dearly. And forgiveness, Lord, that's a whole nother satan. We older brother types have a hard time with forgiveness because rules have been broken and must be paid for. Help us, O oh God, to see the Father in this story as the loving gentleman that he is, welcoming us back. Bless Foundations Church today. Bless Pastor Carl and his wife and his family. I hope they're having a great time. Thank you for him and his gift and his love for you and his passion. We ask these things now in Christ's name.